So, Brett, uh, am I on? Everything? Yeah, you're on. Okay. Just stick it. <coughs> yep. Good. Uh, Brett sends his regards. We, uh, we we swap sometimes. He knew I was coming here, and he's a busy farmer too. So, um, I was asked, and we we had a conversation about networking and really focusing on that. So, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And it's a little different from some of the other pre presenters in the sense that I'm a farmer practitioner as well, but um, both Brett and I are actually farming and, and work for extension, and so we're constantly kind of walking this line between the two. Um, and I, really what we talked about was sharing some of the work that Cornell Extension has done, I think successfully to extend research out into the field and get a lot of adoption and at least a lot of conversation uh, going on. Um, so we're going to share some of those um, examples um, with you. Uh, hopefully to stimulate a little bit of discussion around this because I think at the end of the day the networks and the conversations that are created are really what makes these things actually uh, makes different agroforestry practices land on the ground and, and take root. Um, so just so you're familiar, uh, these are the folks that are associated with agroforestry at Cornell. Myself, um, recently as uh, um, the co-author of the book, Ken Mudge is a retired professor from Cornell. So he's off somewhere camping right now. We don't even know where he is, so good for him. Um, <clears throat> when he retired, I, I was able to fold into the Cornell Small Farms Program, which is a really great as an outreach tool. Um, Pete Smallage is the state extension forester. Brett Chedzoy is actually a county forester, but um, probably like other states, his budget cuts have, have hit the counties. Uh, all the counties become to consolidate, so now he's basically the forester for all of the southern tier, which is about 11 counties. And he manages a farm. I'm not sure how he does that. Um, and then Mike Farrell is up in the um, Adirondack region doing the maple program, which is a big, a big one for us at Cornell. Oh, and Ken, <laughs> I forgot Ken on the, on the bottom. He's. Uh, done a lot to set us up for, for some of the mushroom work we've done. So, um, Some of the things I've been thinking about when we talked about, when Brett and I talked about networks, was that from the extension end that we need to be really consistent with our outreach, um, not expect response, and that doesn't mean no one's paying attention, it just means that people are busy, and allow the farmers to be really flexible on how they interact. And I think that's a really big one, and I'll show some examples of that. Um, Lots of diverse ways and open ways to access information, both passively and actively. Um, Brett and Peter have both been active on these things called Nings. I don't know if anyone's heard of those. Uh, they're kind of like a customizable social media, sort of like a Facebook, but, um, but specific to a topic area. Um, listservs have been one of these things with our small farms program. We have a pig listserv, we have a sheep listserv, we have a mushroom listserv. Some of them are, are big flops, and some of them are incredibly successful, and no one knows why. And if anyone in this room knows why, I would love to know what makes it work. Um, our mushroom listserv has been one of the most successful tools. The pig one will go dormant for, for years on end. Um, another thing we do a lot of is online learning. I know University of Missouri is doing that as well, which has been a really effective tool to reach a lot of rural farmers that um, have a really hard time getting to events. As much as we want to do things in person, um, sometimes that's easier for people to fit in their schedules. That's been really uh, incredible. Um, and uh, Brett and I talked a lot about the fact of all of our events, as well as our online learning, is building in space to talk shop and be social, um, as much as the content. And um, he says that he thinks that some of the Silva Pasture workshops, most of the learning happens when he gives people a break, um, not necessarily when he's yapping on. So I would agree with that. And then we just, we're just really redundant with everything. Um, we cross-link to each other. We're constantly referring to each other um, because we know, even though we think we know where something's available online or you know, as a resource, um, people can't seem to find it. So we just have to keep, keep going ahead with that. Um, we, we think about networking relationships in lots of different capacities, um, these kind of different ones here. So professional to professional is something we do a lot of. Um, campus to counties, um, we try to constantly refer people back to their county extension, even if the extension isn't equipped to handle their question, um, because then we get feedback that the county needs education, and we try to educate them rather than them always calling campus, which is what happens a lot of the time. That's how at least the Cornell Extension system is supposed to work. Um, so that gives us good feedback. Otherwise, if we just field the questions that come into campus, you know, we don't know even uh, who's, who's in a county and what they know, what they don't know. Um, 
professional to farmer, but I really say the bottom one is the most important, that, that what we want, really want to facilitate is this farmer to farmer networking. And again, it doesn't have to be that complicated, um, and it's, it's really setting up the platforms for people to find each other. Um, we have a lot of counties in New York, so again, we refer everyone back to their county uh, for reference and resource, because probably if they're interested in agroforestry practice, they're also interested in some other education that the county can offer. Um, and again, that's, that's the way the system has been designed. So <clears throat> I try to always have a hold on who's in the county. Our small farm farms program has a liaison in every county, so we try to, try to keep connected. It's a little hard with 60 counties, I'll be honest. That's, that's a lot. <clears throat> um, this is our small farms website, and we have an agroforestry page um, as of this year that, that links to those, the projects, essentially those four individuals I mentioned. So this is an easy place that we can point people. Um, one of our successful networking tools has been uh, to develop a leadership team for small farms, which includes uh, farmers, um, consultants, uh, county educators, and campus uh, extension uh, folks. And it's really provided, we meet twice a year. We don't ask for very much other than let us know when something's going on. We meet twice a year. Um, it's been a really effective tool um, to learn and, and to develop as we go. Um, two things we do, I mentioned consistency. So we put out really consistent information. Um, and if you notice, this is our e-newsletter that um, uh, we're using constant contact. So you can make it look essentially like your website, which is actually help people find things on our website. Because the, the bars at the top there are the same as the bars on the website. So people can go right to it. And we do that um, twice a month, uh, every two weeks. We hire a student to do this, uh, to mine the, 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 the web for uh, resources, for events, for job listings, for all sorts of things, and put this together, and then ask if there's anything else we want to add. It's been one of our most effective tools, and we have a list of about 9,000 right now that are receiving this. Um, and it's just that consistency that's really key. And we don't hear back from almost anyone, but we hear through the grapevine how effective that is. Something I'm really excited, I, I just started editing the Small Farm Quarterly, which is four times a year, and that's a print publication. We've formed this really unique network alliance with uh, Lee Publications um, in the Northeast, which is sort of like the penny saver or country folks. If you're familiar with those, those weeklies that go to a lot of these rural mailboxes um, and list tractors and equipment and that sort of thing, well, four times a year, they also get this little supplement. And this newspaper is basically all farmer or extension uh, folks writing articles and putting them in and we do the editing and then we send it off to the, the printer. And that's been a really nice, um, easy and again consistent way to get information out there. And again within that paper we have this advisory team. We actually have a team of editors who are extension people who work for nonprofits or are just farmers. One of our best uh, contributors is up there on the right. Ulf Kinsel is a sheep farmer. Um, his, what's his farm, White Clover Sheep Farm. If you go, if you're interested in sheep, he's got uh, all of his back articles. He's written an article every issue for the last like eight years and very consistent and, um, and takes his job uh, very seriously. He always, he, he makes me send his article back to him with edits and he has to approve it before submission. Uh, online courses I've mentioned before as well. This is something that we were a little resistant to um, in, the, in the beginning, but certainly learning that people really actually this is one way they can actually access this information and a lot of these courses are are filling up pretty quickly um, this past fall i did a mushroom cultivation class it filled in a week and then we opened a second one it filled in two weeks um, it's partially because that crop is just kind of a hot topic right now but there are a lot of almost anyone in that class said oh i wanted to come to your class on campus but there was no way i could make it this is the only way i can learn this type of information those are available to anyone worldwide and we actually get um, a lot of international and, and, and North American participants as well. Our project is supposed to be New York based but actually half of our audience is also from the rest of the US so, um, so that's like not, not a bad thing. Um, the other thing that, that we find really useful is, is the things that people like to do in their free time which is not usually read uh, publications, um, fact sheets. Um, <clears throat> they like to watch videos and they like to watch videos that are less than five minutes long. Um, so this was actually, these, these two series here were in partnership with the Extension Forest Farming Network. Um, some of the folks in this room are a part of that. It's a really 
phenomenal uh, group of folks from different universities that have been working on these. And John Munsell, who's down at Virginia Tech, secured some funding to hire a videographer to come and do a bunch of these videos. Um, so this is actually a silvopasture video series. Um, again, you can find that on our Small Farms website, which has Brett and myself um, and Joseph Orfice, who's in that picture there. He does cattle up in the Adirondacks. Brett does cattle, sheep, and goats, last time I checked. And, and we were, we were in, I was in there doing, talking about our ducks, because we run our ducks through the, through the woods, um, which is a, 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 perhaps a departure from traditional silvopasture, but it's been working well, <laughs> uh, working well for us. Um, uh, and then Ken did a whole series on shiitake cultivation. So I can tell people now, hey, go watch these videos. They're three minutes long. Uh, it's a very easy way to catch up. This was a really successful uh, publication that we did um, on shiitake cultivation. And one of the reasons I really liked it was because it was really grower influenced. It was a, it was a farmer publication written a lot by farmers. Um, so there's lots of grower tips in there. We had a six farmer ed editorial team essentially that poured through. And we put all of our data uh, and all the data from Missouri trials and different things on shiitake. And then we had all the farmers put these little side notes in the bars that say, well, this is actually what happens or this is what my experience is, that sort of thing. And that's been really great. Um, <clears throat> the mushroom cultivation uh, site at Cornell is something that I've been tasked to work on and it keeps growing. We're running out of space on the top uh, to put links, but um, you know, it's really nice to have a, a, a space that I can point people to again. One of the best things we ever did was buy the domain cornellmushrooms.org. Um, if you're at a university, you're probably used to the, oh, well, just go to the simple website, blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 dot, blah, 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 dot, edu. <laughs> And people are scrambling to write that down, and there's lots of weird, like all of our websites have to have cows in them, which is College of Ag and Life Sciences, but you know, nobody ever remembers that. So the way people find information these days is either a really easy to remember URL or Google. So now they can Google Cornell Mushrooms, or they can just type in that URL. And that's been a huge network thing that I didn't even think about. Um, here's an example of our listserv. The Mushroom Grower listserv is actually one of the, the better listservs in terms of growers. It's really fun to have folks chime in. Originally, as part of a grant, we set up this listserv, and actually, uh, we were able to pay some of the farm expert farmers to respond. And those farmers just keep doing it. They just really actually enjoy. And it's cool to hear the theme of, I want to do this on my farm and also share with others. So Steve Sarek's been one of our longtime mushroom farmers. And he's always the first to respond to, um, to the, the inquiries on there. And they, they get pretty interesting. Um, in terms of, of the types of problems people encounter. Um, so that's really easy, and a lot of people are already checking their email, so that doesn't, doesn't make it too much of a, of a burden. Um, Facebook's been something that um, has been interesting. Uh, this, this page is something we just set up and, and just post uh, things to occasionally. And we're, we're, we're doing pretty well, I guess, in the, in the social media world. That's not my expertise, but we seem to continue to get about 10 or 20 likes a week. And that's just increasing our audience. Um, it's not as tight-knit. I don't know as many of the people, but it's certainly getting it out there. And would encourage you all, if you haven't thought about that, to, to use that as a tool for sure. Here's the uh, Cornell Forest Connect. This is Peter Smolage's uh, networking tool here. Again, a resource depot for lots of different things. What I want to focus on with Peter is, again, this consistency uh, feature. So he's been doing webinars for um, the past six, seven years, every month. Um, this is a free service. He'll pull in guests. Actually, recently, there was a silvopasture uh, talk by Brett Chedzoy. And um, it's very easy to find on YouTube, uh, the videos. It's just youtube.com backslash forest connect. Um, really nice way to keep up with forestry education and, uh, and, and get some of this information. And I think posting to YouTube apparently is also very important in the, in the world of people finding this type of stuff. So Peter used to bury this in this website, and people would email him constantly about where this was. And now, with with it being on YouTube, it's actually really easy. Um, so these little things are really uh, are really make quite a big difference. Here's what a Ning looks like. Um, this is the Cornell Forest Connect Ning. Um, there's a, just a couple hundred folks on this one. Um, and again, it's really open for anyone to post events, uh, information. You know, you can go as deep as having a profile and a picture and all these different things. Most people just check this homepage um, or the forums, which are places that people talk about different uh, issues. 
And uh, Silva Pasture also, uh, that's got a, a bit more, it's about 500 people um, on that uh, community conversation. And, um, and Brett's pretty active on, on that one as well, uh, getting the information out there. It's a place for people to post, uh, post their questions, post their inquiries. So in addition to those online resources, um, we've had a lot of success in networking and bringing people together. And, uh, I remember in 2011 was when we held the first Silva Pasture uh, conference in the Finger Lakes. Um, and it was a really interesting event because it was one of those things you would never realize what some of the challenges were with some of these practices until you get those people in the same room. So it was almost like we had, it was like a, a middle school dance. We had like the, the foresters on one side and the grazers on the other. <laughs> and they both didn't speak the same language. Um, and we're trying to like have that conversation like, what are you doing over there and how do we do this? And, um, so that was a huge barrier that we didn't even realize. It's just the lexicon, what are people are used to, the fact that foresters were told in forestry school not to put animals in the woods, uh, and the fact that grazers were told not to put animals near trees. Um, and here we were promoting the exact thing of putting those two things together. Um, you know, and the other thing was just with the grazing community, just the, the, the lack of adoption of just rotational grazing. So Nancy Glazer, who is uh, uh, South Central New York, um, the grazing specialist for again, 10 to 20 counties, I'm not sure how many at this point, um, st started to actually focus her efforts on rotational grazing and said, you know, this conference was great, but maybe we need to step back and talk about this one thing. And Peter said, I'm gonna focus a little bit on uh, thinning, you know, and, and sort of forest management, and then maybe we can reconvene. And that happened a couple years, or last year. Um, there's a really popular grass-fed beef conference in New York called the Green Up, the Winter Green Up, and um, they tacked the Silva Pasture uh, conference onto that, which is a really smart move. So people are already grass-fed, already interested in rotational, and then said, well, here's the next step is to add trees in there. Um, we have a lot of maple uh, work. This summer will be the first International Birch Syrup and Sap. Uh, conference. Uh, Mike Farrell has gotten bored apparently with maple syrup and is looking to other avenues. Um, so we've been doing a couple years of research on black walnut. Uh, we've made some black walnut syrup and now birch is the next, the next one to check out. Um, very interesting. So those, those conferences really help I think give a lot of direct feedback and, and again stimulate those conversations you know like we're doing here. Um, and then we have lots of you know fun events. We seem to have this theme of camp. Um, we have Camp Mushroom every year and Camp Maple. Uh, where people come and, and stay over at the research forest at Cornell. And, um, and you know, I used to value the, the efficiency of a workshop to say, well, I'm going to do this in a couple hours. But actually, the camps are really nice because people spend the night, they eat meals together, and they leave um, feeling a sense of community that I didn't come to appreciate until the last couple of years. And I think that's a really important piece, even though it's a lot more work to put those on. Um, and we're looking at maybe a civil pasture camp in the future as, a, as another, another theme. Um, it gives people time to really integrate what they're thinking. And one of the things we learned at all events is, uh, as Aaron demonstrated very well, is um, it's really uh, unsuccessful in our experience to put a clipboard by the door or say, hey, sign up for this thing. You've got to pass that clipboard around. Um, and then remind everyone afterwards what you want them to do. Uh, I can't say how many people have not joined the listserv after, after an event. Um, and by reminding them and then keeping them on a list that I email anyway, they eventually uh, get on it. Um, and we found constant contact as an example. There's lots of management tools. Uh, we used to have spreadsheet after spreadsheet. Much easier way to manage these emails and, and stay in touch with folks. Um, so I think that's about all I have. I just want to mention um, Catherine Bukowski will be here talking about the Extension Forest Farming uh, Group. This is the YouTube channel uh, for it. And, and again, this is another nice resource with, with different things going on and, and has expanded our notion of network from just state to, to really national. Um, it's been a very successful uh, project here. So um, yeah. Okay. We've got plenty of time for Q&A with Steve, so uh, fire away. Oh, come on. We've got lots of time. We've got... Can you describe those camps in a yeah. little more depth? Sure. Yeah, so um, the, the question was uh, describe those camps in a little more depth. Um, so camp, well, I know Camp Mushroom because um, I've done it for the past few years. It's basically uh, we have a 
old uh, uh, lodge and some cabins at the at the Cornell Forest, and basically we'll have a Friday night. <coughs> Folks will come and and do a dinner. Um, on our good years, we have lots of mushrooms to put into dinner. On our bad years, we, we don't. We just don't mention that. Um, and it's kind of an evening where we uh, do a little bit of presentation, uh, mostly about we've had um, we have a professor at Cornell, George Huddler, who's had one of the most popular courses ever at Cornell. And it's something like mysterious molds and fantastic fungi. And um, he gets hundreds of students, partially because he advertises that he'll talk about hallucinogenics. Um, <laughs> and so students just fill up this course. But he has this great talk about just fungi generally and all the interesting you know, pieces they, they weave in the, the, the world. And so it's a really fun evening, right, that we start with. Um, and it's not content heavy. And then we have usually music and a dessert to pass. Um, and that's been, that's been great. People go, go to bed then, come up the next morning, and we'll do a little bit of content, heavy download. Here's how to do it. Um, and then we'll go and do hands-on, pretty much, for mushrooms. It's pretty easy to inoculate things and, and send them off. And um, we've been able to handle about 40 people for that. Um, at a time, again, we have the, the camp facility, uh, which has been nice for that. Um, we always do it in April, which is a little early <laughs> for having people camp in these cabins. Uh, it seems like the weekend before the camp and the weekend after are always really nice and warm and sunny. And the weekend we schedule it has to be the, the one that drops down and frosts and all these different things. Um, but it's been a really, really well, uh, a well-received event, yeah. So. so how long is the camp? So it's basically like Friday night and they're done Saturday afternoon. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I, again, I, I, every year I'm like, oh, this is such a, a, a load of work to put on. And we do a lot of like two hour classes at county extensions. But the, the people that leave stay in touch better. And they also are, as they see, I haven't done the study to see this, but they seem more likely to adopt the practice. And at least they stay in touch about it. Um, so there is something to that, that commitment of time. So we had the quarterly mm -hmm. paper on print copy. Do you see print copy going away as sort of not being as functional for networking, or do you still see a role for it? Yeah, so the question was about the quarterly and sort of seeing the print uh, methods of communication going away or staying. Um, I actually think the, the realizing our constituents in these rural counties of New York and, and in the Northeast um, and getting already getting country folks and actually appreciating that, they, there's some people at our extensions that will call the extension office still and ask for the extension agent to print something out because they don't have a printer or a computer or something like that. Or they'll call saying, I read this notice for the class in the newspaper. I need to find out more about it. And the extension agent will say, well, here's the website. And they're like, I don't have access. So actually, uh, at least in the Northeast, rural internet access is still pretty limited. And we've seen the trend to be to put everything online. But there's a huge value, I think, in people getting something in their mailbox. Um, you know, there's always the concern the reason print media went out was because of all the cost and all the advertising. But um, Lee has told me that at least they have to raise a revenue for that paper to be printed. They've had no problem getting the interest, and it's partially because um, it's reaching about thirty to fifty thousand households. So there's a you know a considerable amount of people that want to get it. So hopefully not. <laughs> I like still holding something, you know, tangible. So yeah, good question. <coughs> Maybe this is a comment more than a question, but one of the points that you have kind of consistently raised here is uh, to the redundancy. Like, we do it, we do it, we do it in this format, we do it in this format, we do it, we repeat it in this format, we do it in this format. And um, I feel like we're all kind of running into that, but I also feel like it's, I, I go crazy with the time it takes to try to get all that stuff. <coughs> have I posted this here? Have I posted this there? Um, mm -hmm. Do you, we're looking at our organization at content comment, but not everybody can do that. Do you have any, like, do you have any helpful hints for how to negotiate your life when you're trying to cross post a half a dozen different yeah. things all the time? You have a thought on that? I'll just, I guess I'll repeat the question, the comment first, <laughs> which was uh, about sort of the overwhelming factor of posting and trying to be redundant and get things out there, but, but how do you keep track with that with a busy, busy schedule? So you want to? Uh, where, where are you reading all this? <laughs> well, I was going to cop out and say students, but. <laughs> so what we've, we've done, we don't have, we have a lot of, just at the farm level, we're on a couple different 
um, so ways that we get the word out as well and um, schedule. You can you can schedule posts. You can do that. A lot of platforms have that. Um, Mailchimp's a good like free service at first if you're just starting to play with that. And to know, like, like you're saying, like do less really well first, and then find out about your end user and let them. Kind of, I don't know. But the key is to like, get your yeah. members to talk amongst themselves, and all you have to do is moderate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, I don't know. We fall back a lot on just email and mm -hmm. and um, something around that of organization because I think that's still where people, most people, consistently will get. The information. Um, the student thing is a joke, but it's also true. We've we've been able to, um, and it could be an internship, it could be something like that. But 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 that's a re actually a really good um, skill and something that that they value learning about, and it also can can help with the time thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Questions. Sure. Um, the question is, in you're looking at like having ha having a good stable network. Are there key kind of people with different skill sets you want to make sure for your base? Like mm. you have some like mm -hmm. you're a you're a like a hub for information. But are there other people that help? You know, you're not doing it alone. Like right. you, you know, you always have folks that kind of lurk on the fringe. But are there certain mm -hmm. kind of characteristics you describe as need for a good network to work well? Like you need? Yeah, so the question was characteristics of people or of oh, the people. of people for a good network to, to happen. Yeah, like you're like the, the worker bee or you're like the hub. Yeah, there probably is. We could probably generate a good a good list of, of characteristics. Um, I think that, that the key things we've we've been finding is um, at least our small farm team. So we all do individual projects, like I'm agroforestry, someone else is doing no tillage, some or, or reduced tillage, excuse me. Um, different project areas, but then we all convene together and say, well, I like to edit articles and do this. So that's how I became the editor. It wasn't like anything else other than that. Someone else is much better at the computer stuff. Constant contact makes my head hurt, but someone else is good at that. I think the best thing we've done as a small farms team is said, well, what do you like to do and what are you good at? And can we you know, find the distribution? That's worked pretty well. Cool. Um, and, the, and then everything else we give to the students. <laughs> yeah. So. Any additional questions for Steve? We have a couple more minutes before we're going to take a break, and I'll have yeah. more to comment about the break. The camps. Camps. Um, that's been a really interesting. That's a great question. So the question is, how much we charge for the camps? Um, it's been it's it's been sort of similar to charging for fruit when uh, you're an extension system that's used to charging five dollars for everything. Um, <laughs> um, but yet, the, that's because the county was or the state was funding everything, and, and that's really changed. So we've experimented with that. It was uh, forty dollars for the weekend, and when I first got there, I did a budget with Ken. I was like, "How? Wait, how did, wait this doesn't work. Forty dollars, three meals. You know, wait a second. So um, part of it was being subsidized the whole time. So we actually looked at the real cost, and and we slowly <laughs> increased it. So it's uh, it's uh, seventy dollars for the weekend, and then a hundred dollars for uh, if you're staying overnight. So commuters pay 70 for that Friday, Saturday with three meals. We've been able to then also do kind of like you know local food and, and organic and that sort of thing. And and people have not been uh, un you know uh, it has not been a problem to pay that. We always have a few scholarships. We make sure people can get there, but um, it hasn't been prohibitive. The other thing we found is we can for like a two or three hour mushroom class. Um, you know a lot of these county extensions were like no way can we charge more than five bucks? No one will come. Um, but what we did is we charged thirty dollars, and we gave everyone a log to take home, and those filled up immediately. I mean, it wasn't hard. I think the take home is really nice. Uh, people feel like that's a value, and it's been the slow process of getting the extensions comfortable with that. Um, but yeah, that's been our experience. Yeah. Steve, I actually have a, a question about webinars. Uh -huh. Do you have any data on how effective they are and how many people you reach? Yeah, so there's, depending on who is, is doing them, um, Peter Smolage, uh, sorry, repeating the question is, uh, uh, do you have any data on webinars and how effective they are at reaching people? Um, so uh, Peter Smolage would actually be a great person to connect with on that because he's really kept a lot of that information and he does follow up with the, 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 the next survey, which is, you know, how much of this do you retain and how much have you adopted and that sort of thing. Um, it's hard to know because it, in a webinar, you know, you can be playing the webinar but not even at the computer, uh, <laughs> which probably happens. And I've done that a few times, I know. Um, is that on record? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I think one of the challenges we, we're, we're grappling with as a, as a networking tool is that that's really useful as a, a way to get the information out and a way to have it stored for people to access. Um, I don't think it's as effective as a learning tool as that the opposite, which would be like the camp. Um, in terms of what we want to see in the end is adoption. So exposure to information, advanced study, yeah, but you know, that's, that's a hard one. And I think uh, we can point to a lot of just, and Cornell has a lot of research on education generally, and that isn't necessarily the most effective tool. And the online courses, we've really focused on making sure they're interactive and that people are working on things so it's not just like a bunch of webinar presentations. Um, so that's a tricky one. It's a good, yeah, yeah. Because I think in the end of the day, um, at least at, at our university system, you know, you report your contact hours, right? Which you can say, well, there's 80 people, and I talked for two hours, so I have 160 hours. But I think those those hours are very different than the the face to face or the social uh, type of of settings. Um, that said, I think actually it might be interesting to rank these. So the listserv is is very high on my list in terms of effectiveness um, as a grower myself to be able to know there's a place I can go post a question get six responses and then be able to make a decision is pretty amazing and um, the sheep one we're now on the sheep one because we're new sheep uh, farmers and it's that's that's a funny one because people are literally it seems like texting from the field with like an emergency <laughs> but they'll get a response you know and they'll get a response and I think that that um, that's underestimated as a tool as well that people really come to rely on so you know, technology, there's, there's, there's some balance in there, yeah. All right, any other last questions for Steve? No, I'm going to take a break. And if you think of something else, he'll be back in oh, an hour, <laughs> back up here. So let's get, uh, give our oh, thanks to Steve for his, his uh, <laughs>